الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to a very special One Path Network special today we have with us Ustaz Nu'man Ali Khan who is the CEO and founder of the Bayana Institute in the US he is an international speaker whose teaching style and perspective has inspired many people around the world his ability to ex explain the Quran and help people understand the Quran has been very, very popular for specifically for Muslims living in the West. With us today to share his experiences, answer some questions. Um, Ustaz Naman Ikan, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. It's a pleasure being here. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. I mean, this is your first time in Australia. How is it so far? Awesome. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Now, we have something very, very important that I've got to do before we start this uh, yeah, yeah. show, inshallah. I've got to take a selfie, man. <laughs> let's do this. Okay, let's do this. really bad at this. Man, I'm really bad at this. <laughs> Here we are. Ready? Yeah. Okay, okay. now that the important business is done, inshallah, we can start with a question. Alhamdulillah, we've had, uh, we've received a lot of uh, excellent questions from the audience. Um, you are uh, an inspiration to many people. You run a dream program in the, in the US, which is a, an intensive Arabic course. You speak at regularly at conferences, um, and you want to make the Quran and Arabic accessible to many people around the world. I mean, what's, uh, what's a day in the life of Numan Ali Khan, and what's your plan for the world? So those are two very different questions. The day in my life is actually pretty typical. Um, uh, my year is divided into two parts. Uh, nine months out of the year when I'm involved with the dream program, which is the intensive that you refer to, I have a very set schedule, and the other three months are chaos. This trip is part of the chaos. So, uh, but it, most of the year, nine months out of the year, uh, you know, our, my teaching schedule used to be for the last four years from eight o'clock to 2.30. Uh, the program goes on. I have full-time students that are studying for uh, five days a week at least. And then on a Friday, every Friday, they have an exam. So I'm off on Fridays typically. But the other five days, at least for five consecutive months, I'm there from eight o'clock in the morning to 2.30 teaching with some breaks in the middle. And so that's how my mornings are spent after, you know, uh, of course, uh, after Fajr, I try and memorize some Quran, drop the kids off at school, from there rush over to campus, classes get started with the students, and for five straight months, that's what my schedule looks like. I spend some time with students, do some administrative work. I'm done with campus about 4.30 in the afternoon, okay. and then I turn my cell phone off. And from 4.30 in the afternoon until uh, pretty much the next day, I'm with family, you know, uh, masjid, and just whatever, own my own studies, taking, you know, visiting my parents and all of these fantastic, kinds of things. Fantastic, fantastic. That's yeah. a great example for all of us, inshallah. What is your plan for the world? Okay, so that's a big one. Now, my, I, I want to share with everybody that, you know, we can have lofty goals, but at the end of the day, uh, we have to begin with ourselves, right? So I assessed what my needs were as a Muslim growing up, especially in the West. And after traveling, I realized those needs are not actually limited to myself and my experience. Those are the needs of the average Muslim. There are lots and lots of problems that we have to try and solve. Uh, there are lots of areas of concern. But I felt maybe I can make a little bit of a dent in one space, and that is to familiarize as many people as possible with uh, the Qur'an. And the, 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 in the short term, to at least try to take the intimidation of trying to understand the Qur'an away. Because, of course, the study of tafsir and the study of the classical texts can be pretty intimidating. Even for a seasoned student, it can be a pretty advanced study. And there isn't anything in between, like a stepping stone that gets people familiar. It's easy enough, I can internalize this, I can enjoy studying this, and then I can go on to more advanced studies. That's in the short term. In the long term, I would envision that our ummah, if you know, we had a minimum standard of education, where you know, our teenagers were so familiar with classical Arabic that they would be able to understand the Quran, at least from a language perspective, they wouldn't have a barrier between themselves and the Quran. That's a pretty, pretty incredible accomplishment for an ummah. That our high school graduates, or you know, our teenagers, our uh, people under 20, are already directly familiar with the Book of Allah, and that's a long-term goal. And that that means that we have to, you know, standardize Arabic education for the ummah. So my vision, you know, on the one hand is related to the Quran, but in order to really sustainably create a relationship between the Muslims and the Quran, you have to proliferate the Arabic language. And you have to take intimidation away from the study of the Arabic language and systemize it. Right now there are no standards. There are schools, different parts of the world that are trying to teach Arabic in their own methods. And all of that's great. And there are some fantastic efforts. But the problem, especially for us in the West, 
is that we, even if you, probably many of you as individuals, tried to study the Arabic language, tried one curriculum, some things worked, some things didn't work. You tried studying it somewhere else, you tried studying it somewhere else. So we're experimenting. Even our Islamic schools are experimenting, you know that, right? So they, they go from one curriculum to another to another. So in my experience, because of me as a student and then myself as a teacher for the last 15 years, I'm convinced that a particular approach to education works within Arabic, because I've seen results with it. I've seen my students who are now teachers that have not gone abroad to study Arabic. They've studied Arabic in Texas, of all places, and now they're, they're teaching Arabic, you know? So I know that it works. I, I, can, I can testify for myself through my own experience that it works. So I want to now not just use that to teach a course or two, but to create a platform and a standard that schools around the world, teachers around the world, you know, imams around the world that would like to teach Arabic in their communities, you know, and the people would like to study on their own, they have kind of a unanimous standard. And they're speaking the same language. So even as students, if they're some, somebody in Australia is studying a unit five, then they can actually have the same conversation with somebody studying in England, with somebody studying in Bangladesh, and they're all understanding each other because there's a standard that's been created, right? So that's, that's part of my vision for the, for the Arabic side. You know, and the inshallah ta'ala, the, the, the vision for the, for the uh, Quran side is even bigger. Because this is obviously, as I've, if I've been able to explain this clearly, Arabic to us is a stepping stone. And really the goal is a direct connection for the ummah with, with the book of Allah. And by extension, all of the ulum of the deen. Now the, the thing with uh, uh, Quran is that there are lots of barriers to cover. Uh, you know, many, many people are, uh, they've been exposed to a college education. So they're familiar with the idea of literary criticism, right? So you read something and you critique it and you uh, pick it apart. And we have a sort of a Western critical mind, not just in the West, but actually all over the world because college education, even in the East, is actually based on Western models of education. It's the same standards, right? So because of that critical mind, we can't help ourselves but ask certain critical questions when we read anything. We just, it's part of how we're programmed now. Yes. And so people bring this critical mentality even to the Qur'an. So people ask questions like, why are there so many stories repeated in the Qur'an? Which I think was one of the questions that was coming up, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, why is there so much repetition? And why are the surahs not in chronological order? And these kinds of questions. So we can study classical tafsir, but classical, the, the mufassir who wrote his tafsir 800 years ago, he had certain questions in his mind, and he attempted to write his tafsir trying to answer those questions. We have different questions now. We have different questions now. So even though we'll get some benefit from those tafasir, we have to frame the education based on the questions that we have and that we're asking. So there needs to be a reconstruction of you know, Quranic education based on the kinds of confusions and criticisms people are developing on their own at this point. Right? So even though the, the texts and our sources are timeless and they're going to be the same, the way the responses are going to be packaged and framed and discussed, it has to be updated. It really seriously needs to be updated. And that's my, my hope, inshallah ta'ala, that there's from the elementary level to all the way, inshallah ta'ala, to PhD and higher levels of, of research in Quranic studies, that this kind of an education can be provided. You, you, you do describe yourself in a recent article that you wrote that you're more of a liaison between real scholarship and the larger public as opposed to a real scholar, which is uh, or a scholar yourself. I mean, what's the difference in obligation between a scholar um, a da'i, a teacher, or just a general Muslim that's living sure. in the West? That's a fantastic question. Uh, and I'll share, I'm, I'm going to be completely frank and honest with you. I'm not going to hold back what I have in my head, inshallah. Great, that's, that's and what you're, you want. You're, yeah, and you're, you're totally free to disagree with me, but this is the conclusion that I've reached after uh, my own experiences and just observing what's going on in the Muslim world, in my, in my own observation. Uh, so what we have, unfortunately, in the Muslim community overwhelmingly is this idea of absolute solutions. Right, we, when we have, we, we, we look, look up to someone, we look up to them in every single way. Right, so if there's an imam in your masjid, and I love my imam in my masjid, uh, he must have all the answers to all my problems that pertain to Islam. I believe that that's an oversimplification and it's a problem that we think in this way. You know, in my article, I actually said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam carried the burden of the entire, every burden of this ummah he carried on his shoulders. And after his passing, after him, that one burden that was carried by one man is barely being carried by an entire ummah. Right? It's been distributed to all of us and we all together can barely lift it. In other words, to expect everything from one person is unrealistic. 
Now, even within scholarship, let's talk, start at the top, the ulama. I personally believe the ulama are people of specialization. You know how in college you have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, then you have a PhD, right, a doctorate? The ulama are not people with a bachelor's. The ulama are not people with a master's. The ulama are people with PhDs. And when you get to that level, you specialize. You specialize either in Islamic finance, or in tafsir, or in hadith. You become a muhaddith, you become a faqih. You become some kind of a specialist in one area of Islamic studies. Of course, you have a lot of knowledge about all the other areas of Islamic studies, but there's one area where you are specialized. Yes. And so we have to, first of all, identify the specialists in different areas of Islamic studies and go to them for the areas that they have specialized in. That's one thing. The second thing is on a, a, a step below that. These are the, the scholars. A step below that are the, the a'imma, the leaders. The leaders, the imams of our masajid, the imams that are doing the courses and classes in our communities. These are people that are also, compared to us, they're also ulama. Compared to us, they're also scholars. But in the grand scheme of things, they are actually, they're a liaison between us and the actual specialists, the top people in their field. In other words, this, my, my imam has also studied hadith, but he's not a muhaddith. There's a difference. My imam also knows fiqh, but he's not a faqih. That's his teacher. That's someone above him. But I don't have a connection to that one, the, the, the person on top. My imam becomes a connection to him. Do you understand? Even though he himself has a degree, degree in sharia, or he's also got ijazat himself. Yes. But that's, it's, a, it's a level below. And we have to respect that fact. We have to respect that they are also students. You know, we don't give them absolute authority. It's not good for them, it's not good for us to do that. Now uh, below them, this is the category now where things get interesting. Below the imams and the people that have you know, uh, uh, ijazat and credentials in Islamic studies. Below them is a category that I put myself in, the du'at or the activists, you can call them. These are people that are on the ground. These are people that maybe some of you, when you were in your younger years, you spent a lot of time doing activities in the MSA, or you volunteer a lot at a masjid, or you help out with Islamic programs, or you're involved in da'wah activities, or you're involved in a, a Sunday school or a Saturday school or an Islamic school. You're not scholars, but you're trying to do Islamic work. You're trying to teach in some capacity. Either you're teaching kids, or you're running a youth group, or you know, one of these things you're trying to do, right? And you, because you have a profession, you have family, you have other obligations, you don't have the opportunity to go, you know, and, and go for a few years and go get a degree in Sharia, or go study tafsir for, you know, you know uh, somewhere in the Muslim world or something. You don't have that opportunity. And that's okay. But right now, what we've done in the West is we've, because this category, this void was not filled easily, we tried to have our imams fill that void, but the problem was our imams received a very formal training. And when they try to ke teach children that are 14 years old, they try to teach what they learned from their shaykh, and this 14 year old doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> so you have to have people that can connect better, but the people who connect better aren't very knowledgeable in Islam. They're not very well educated, so you've got a con communication gap. Yes. And so we, we, we've tried to fill it kind of on our own as best we can. Now there's YouTube videos and you, know, you can buy a book or two and read it and teach whatever you, you, know, you think you understand, etc. But I feel like this category, we need to create a standard for them too. Just like there's a standard for the PhD, and there's a standard for the Imam, there should be an educational standard for the Da'i. There should be one. And that, the, 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 the qualities of it, it's a long discussion. But at the very least, what I want to share with you in this conversation, there should be a standard, number one, and number two, they, the most important feature of that standard is they should know their limits. Yes. Me as a da'i, I am not a faqih, and I'm not a scholar in aqidah, nor in hadith, nor in anything else. So if you come and ask me a question about any of those things, I'm going to say, mm, why don't you go to this imam, or go to your own imam actually, that's what I'll say, go to your own masjid, go to your imam, he's the right person to ask this question. When people come up to me and say, what do you think about organ donation or whatever, then I'm not going to answer that question. I'm, I just, I'm simply not qualified, right? So the, the most important thing about a da'i is they need to know their limits. They need to know what I cannot talk about. This is beyond my scope or my qualification. We are living in an age where we are so free to express our opinions that we are kind of reckless talking about our opinions on matters that we're not really fully knowledgeable of. Right, that's what social media has turned us into. Everybody's got a very strong opinion even though they're entirely ignorant. <laughs> You know, so that needs to be undone a little bit. And the other thing, because we're so desperate, this is my last comment and we can move on inshallah. My, uh, my personal assessment is that du'at, the people that are activists, because there's such a gap in the West especially, 
and we don't have anybody else. So forget imams and forget on top of that the PhD at a high level. So these people have become our scholars. They, people assume them to be the ulama. Like everywhere I go, Sheikh, how are you? <laughs> like, dude, I'm not a Sheikh. Like, Sheikh either in culturally in the Muslim tradition means a, a well qualified scholar, or in the Arabic sense it means an old man. I am neither. So, <laughs> oh, sorry, Sheikh. Oh, Sheikh. I mean, Sheikh. the best one was at one conference, one guy said, Our next speaker is Brother Imam Sheikh Alama Ustad Norman. <laughs> I am none of those things. Just our spe next speaker is Norman. That's good enough. You know what I'm saying? So we have to, like, if we delineate this, I think Islamic education will will benefit quite a bit. That's uh, an excellent perspective, Ustad Norman. And you are somewhat of a specialist, and people look up to you in the West when it comes to Quran. And the Quran is the biggest miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's the word of Allah subhanahu wa taala. It's a, a means of guidance. It's a therapy for all the problems. Um, Sister Dal Dalia Ayub asks the question whether educators in the West should shift focus from memorization to understanding the Quran. And Sister Anna Ramlawi asks a similar question in regards to how schools can actually balance uh, between reading, memorization, and understanding as well. Okay. That's, that's actually a fantastic question. Um, so what happens in our community is um, we love extremes. So when, when we want to emphasize uh, tajweed, then we become obsessive compulsive with tajweed. And you can study tajweed for 10 years and still say, I don't know how to say, I, my qalqala is still a little bit off. Because you're going to have these people that are so specialized in the science of tajweed that you cannot get past Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You're going to say Bism, and the sheikh will say, no, Bism. And you're like, that's what I said. No, no, you didn't. Say it again. And you're going to say Bismillah for 10 years and still not get ijazah in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay, so, and that's because they're perfectionists. And that's fine. I mean, there's somebody should be a perfectionist. Every science should have its perfectionist. But the problem is, because every single one of these areas of study, you can just dive in and never come out. It's a, there's a tendency for us to become obsessive compulsive. And when you focus too much on one thing, necessarily you're compromising other things. So what happens as a result? There's an averse reaction. So people say, these people, all they care about is memorization and tajweed, but they don't even understand the Qur'an. We should emphasize the understanding of the Qur'an. Forget about the memorization, forget about the tajweed. In other words, one extreme gave birth to another extreme. Another extreme. So we need to understand this idea of a balanced approach in education. The Qur'an has a right to be recited properly. The Qur'an has a right to be memorized. It has some, it's something that the Muslim is supposed to need, hold very near and dear to them, the memorization of the Qur'an. But the Qur'an at the same time, I would argue from what little I understand, the Qur'an actually uh, demands to be understood. It demands to be understood. And what I'll say here, these are my own thoughts, you're free to disagree. And my, my own thoughts on this subject are that these things are interconnected and inseparable. I'll tell you how. You know how wudu is inseparable from salah? Right? Now tell you, the thing with tajweed, for example, is tajweed forces you to recite slowly. Isn't that the case? Like it forces you to take your time with every letter. Now if you're saying something slowly, isn't it true that you, now you have, to t you have the time to think about what you're saying? Like if you said it too fast, you wouldn't have the time to think about what you're saying. So what tajweed is doing naturally is it's forcing you to take your time with the word of Allah, which is giving you naturally the time to what? Think. What is memorization doing? It's forcing you to repeat and repeat and repeat. When you repeat something over and over again, does it not force you to think about it? It absolutely does. In other words, the ayat that keeps saying, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ So you understand, so you understand, so you understand. All these other rites of the Qur'an, memorization of the Qur'an, tajweed of the Qur'an, you know, the, the, the study of the language of the Qur'an, all of them are actually headed towards one goal. You develop this really powerful relationship with the Book of Allah. You know, I am so happy Sometimes I get sad, sometimes I get happy about this. I didn't memorize the Qur'an in my youth. I did not. I'm memorizing the Qur'an now. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been doing it very little at a time. Very little at a time. But I'm enjoying it so much. Like I don't think I would have enjoyed it this much when I was younger. <laughs> Even though it would have been a lot easier for me when I was younger. And you know why? Because when I'm memorizing and I'm repeating an ayah and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it, I start thinking, whoa, that word right there. Oh my God, I never thought about it like that. Oh my God, how, how beautifully this ayah is connected to the next ayah. And I would not have even thought of that if I said it once. But because I'm repeating it ten times, it's forcing me to think about the ayat constantly. You know? Yes. So these three things are actually interconnected. And it's not you compromise one for the other, but we have to find a blend 
you know, a, 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 you know, a healthy connection between all of them and create an education, inshallah ta'ala, that is able to do that and make dua that we're able in Bayina because that's, this is what we do. That we're able to offer the, the community some sort of standard practices that uh, you know, they can follow in a Sunday school setting, in a youth group setting, in an Islamic school setting, in their own personal goals, how you can balance these things and move forward in a, in a measurable way, inshallah. It's a great um, perspective, uh, Ustaz Mamman, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us all from the memorizers of the Quran, Amin, from Rabbi. the people that give it the haq in tilawa, and from the people that understand it and apply it in action as well. Um, Ustaz, you are a father of six, and raising Muslim children in the West is, uh, of course, not an easy thing. Um, our children are expected to learn Arabic, understand it, learn the Quran, understand it. They've got school, they've got tutoring, they do their sports. Yeah. I mean, what is the realistic expectation on a Muslim child that's living in the West? And Sister Rabi Hakanj asks a question about if there are any changes required to make, chi uh, make teaching of Arabic uh, more effective in the West. Yeah, oh, I think there are lots of changes required. Uh, so th and this is a two-part question, so let's try to take tackle both of these sides. Uh, first and foremost, I think um, a lot of very concerned parents uh, that are that have found deen themselves and now they're becoming parents so they're really worried about their kids I'm, I've get, I get mothers coming up to me that are not even mothers yet they're, they're like eight months pregnant how, what am I going to do with my baby how do I how do I teach them Quran at what age do I start teaching them to memorize I was like, uh, relax lady how about you worry about the delivery date right now and <laughs> we'll talk about this later and then some, some mother will come up to me with their six month old baby or a one year old you know when they're sleeping I play a lot of Quran uh, when do I start making sure that they've memorized this? I was like, L relax. You know, and then the people come up with three years of age. My child plays with toys too much. Yeah, he's three years old. <laughs> That's what they're supposed to do. What do you want them to lead taraweeh right now? What do, what do you, <laughs> you know, we get, we get so <laughs> concerned about raising kids right that I think a lot of times, again, we go back to the OCD, right? The, the obsessive compulsive disorder. We want to overdo it with our kids because we missed out. So we want to overdo it with them. The problem is we forget the fact that they're still kids. They're still children. If you overdo it with them, there's going to be an adverse reaction. If you make them, make them memorize, make them memorize, make them memorize, and make them pray, and make them, and you force it all the time, by the time they become teenagers, you're going to see rebellion. And then you're going to be shocked. You're going to say, Why, but he memorized 10 juz. How is he rebelling? Because you forced it. You did too much. So we have to create an environment where learning religion for our children is enjoyable. They like doing it. They have a good time doing it. There are rewards associated with it. There's a sense of accomplishment associated with it. And you have to understand in this space, I think it's really important to understand children's educational psychology and ch children, child psychology also. Why? Because at certain ages, children have certain aptitudes. There are certain ages where kids are better at hands-on learning. There are certain ages where kids are really good at memorizing. There are certain ages where they become cognitive and they need something that they can think about and analyze. You know, there are certain ages where they really need to have discussion-based education. What we have, unfortunately, is one formula of education, and doesn't matter if you're three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, or ten, it's the same formula that applies across the board. Now, alhamdulillah, we're living in times where this stuff has been researched. There are best practices in education, and we, we need to bring them to Islam. And wallahi, a lot of them are actually directly inspired by the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam anyway. They really have been. So that needs to be the case. And now here's, here's, the, here's what I say is a realistic goal. Let's talk about Arabic, because we have a limited time here. So let's talk about Arabic goals for children's education for a little bit. You know, idealistically, people say, well, I want my child to go to Islamic school, and by the time they are done, they should be able to speak Arabic. You know, and he memorizes the whole thing, he's got tajweed, he's, he can receive, you read any tafsir, he can speak Arabic, like it flows out of him like a waterfall, like, you know, it's just beautiful when he speaks Arabic. And you have these like lofty goals, they have to do this, 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 this. Now the problem is, we've had Islamic schools in America, in England, here, you know, other places, in some cases for 30, 40 years. Have we produced this result? No. You know why? Because we have idealistic goals that aren't rooted in practical milestones. We, have, we don't have practical milestones. You have to identify practical milestones. Now, if, if you want to get results, first you have to understand what are your obstacles? What is in your path? What is keeping these kids from learning properly? I tell you, in America, a lot of money is spent on Spanish education in public schools. Certified teachers, millions of dollars per state are spent so that children can learn a second language, Spanish. And guess what? Are they seeing results? No. 
they're still not seeing results. I did Spanish in high school in America. I was actually fluent when I graduated. But in a year, it was gone. Now, if you ask me why was it gone, what's the reason? I don't have anybody to speak Spanish with. I mean, I could say, I could vent my frustrations in Spanish if my wife is yelling at me or something, just so she doesn't know what I'm saying. And she says, what'd you say? I'll say I was doing dhikr or something. You know, like, <laughs> I could do that, but, <laughs> you know, I, I have no one to speak to. Now, I'm a teacher of the Arabic language. Do you know the only reason I know to speak Arabic is because I'm forced to teach it all the time. If I was not teaching Arabic, if I just took the summer off and just didn't teach anything, guess what would happen? I'd forget, I, just, I teach, I do it for a living and I would forget. How do you expect children to remember after summer vacation? <laughs> like how do you expect, it's not realistic, right? Because we're, we're, we've set too high a goal. Now my, I, I, so I decided to come up with a curricular strategy uh, that we're inshallah launching, we're testing with a few schools and hopefully by the end of next year, we're gonna release it to schools around the world, inshallah ta'ala, and even self-learners around the world. The, the realistic goals are as follows. Now this might sound unrealistic to you, but hear me out. Imagine a teenager, 16 years old, they've graduated, 17 years old, they've graduated out of high school, out of 12. They can they, they, when they hear the Quran recited, they understand it, number one. They, have a, they don't have the entire vocabulary of the Quran, but they have a majority vocabulary of the Quran, number two. Uh, number three, they can, they can listen to a simple, not an advanced, a simple, Arabic tafsir of the Quran, like a shaykh explaining the ayat of the Quran in Arabic, they can listen to it and they can benefit from it. They don't have to, they don't, they're not able to read like, you know, Al-Kashaf or like Alusi or like, you know, Ruhul Ma'ani and these advanced tafsir, but they're able to read like a tafsir al-Sha'rawi, no problem. They can read like Muhammad Ratib al Nabulsi's work, no problem. They can read even a Shawkani, it's not that advanced, it's fine, they can handle it. In other words, they can handle some basic Arabic tafsir on their own, 16 year old. They don't speak Arabic fluently. Like if, you know, if they're Lebanese or Moroccan or Egyptian, they're probably gonna speak Ammiya anyway, right? But in Fusha, they're not speaking all that much Fusha, but when it comes to reading and understanding, they're at 100% comprehension. They're at that level. I think that's actually pretty amazing. If you could pull that off by 16 years old, that's, this kid is gonna be a much better, better asset to the Ummah than I ever was. You know, if you just put them in the right direction, because the Arabic, which is the, one of the biggest hurdles, has already been cr crossed. Much of it has been crossed, you know. And their path to learning Islam has been opened. I think that's actually a very easily attained goal, and it's based on small targets per year. Small, measurable targets per year. So I know I'm giving you the final product, what happens after 16. But it actually happens with little, little, little goals per year that are measurable, that are, that are respectful of the fact that there's going to be summer vacation and people are going to forget. Respectful of the fact that many parents don't even speak Arabic, so they can't practice it at home. So they can't even get any reinforcement. We have to take these realities into consideration when we create a curriculum. My final comment on this. We're living in the West. We're trying to teach our children a foreign language. For all practical purposes, it is a foreign language. Wallahi. <laughs> Wallahi, ظننت أنه لا يتحدث بالعربية. Okay. I, I heard somebody speaking in the Lebanese dialect. I could swear to I swear to God, I did not know they were speaking Arabic. I was like, his Hebrew is amazing. I, I don't know what that is, but it's 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 amazing. You know. Now the thing is, the the reason I'm telling you this is, uh, because we, you know, the 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 uh, the, the, the curricula that we use nowadays, we get a curriculum from Jordan, we get a curriculum from Morocco, we get a curriculum from Egypt, we get Al Arabiya to Bainayadaik, we love that book, right? And we get, we get these books and we start teaching them in Australia. The problem is these books were written where? They were written over there, for who? They were either written for Arab kids, living in an Arab society, or they were written for Arabic students that are actually immersed in an Arab society where their, their teacher is going to be speaking with them Arabic eight, 10 hours a day so they can learn to speak in Arabic and communicate. Is that the situation for our children? No, they're getting a 30 minute, 40 minute period a day. You cannot take that curriculum and apply that here and expect results. You're not gonna see it. I love Al Arabiya Bin Ayyadaik. I learned from Al Arabiya Bin Ayyadaik. I would never teach it to my kids though. Not, not, in, not, in, cause it's not, the, it's not made for them. That's not what it's for. You have to understand what a curriculum is for. What are the goals for this child, you know? 
So that's the that's the, the the line that has to be drawn, and a lot of serious thought has to be put into this, inshallah ta'ala. That's a very interesting perspective, Ustad. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, having measurable targets and goals. Um, the question that uh, we have is that the Quran is very unique. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu says, "Khairukum man ta'alam al-Quran wa alama." The best of you is the one who learns the Quran and teaches it as well. How should um, education institutions measure the success? of learning the Qur'an? Is it the ability to read? Is it the ahkam? Is it the number of pages memorized? Is it the change of character? What's your perspective on this? So, okay, um, I, I'd like to start by saying that, you know, um, Islamic education, not just Qur'anic education, but Islamic education is not informative, it is transformative. The purpose of the education in Islam is that it transforms your personality, right? And that you, you see the world differently. If, if you learn the religion, you're supposed to see the world differently. Everybody thinks about money a certain way, you think about money differently. Everybody thinks about marriage a certain way, you think about it differently. The whole point of religious education is it's supposed to change your perspective. You know, your outlook on life, your priorities. That's what it's supposed to do. Unfortunately, we overwhelmingly in the Muslim world have turned Islamic education into an informative exercise. Right, so we teach a lot of information, right? And our children have a lot of information. If you ask them about Badr and Uhud, they can tell you the details. If you ask them to recite a surah, they can recite the surah to you. If you ask them to observe the ahkam of tajweed and they've studied that, they can do that. Right? But at the same time, they're still obsessed with the same video games that the Christian kid is obsessed with. And there's, they still want the same things in life that everybody else wants. There are kids that I've seen that memorize Quran, that have already finished the hifz of Quran, and they're in the same trouble that kids in gangs are in trouble with. Same exact thing. What's the problem? We've approached Islam as an, an educational exercise that's informative, but not transformative, right? Now, I can't give you, you know, uh, the, the goals, how you measure success first. First, we have to understand why are we teaching to begin with? We are teaching to transform children. We want them to be transformed. We want them to become different than everybody else. That's, that's our goal. In order to do that, we ha that requires not just that you give them information, but you actually understand what's going on in their head. You know when a kid is listening to you and going, you think that everything you say they have accepted, but they haven't. They have some other thing going on in their head, and the only reason they're doing this is, that if you do this, then the teacher won't pick on you, because the teacher thinks that you understand. You know, it's the best defense mechanism. <laughs> and that's like, now you're not going to get picked on. What do we need in our education? We need discussion. I need to know what's going on in your head, and I won't know until you tell me. And you won't tell me until you're comfortable with me. And you won't open your mouth and tell me what your thoughts are, your feelings are, your fears are, your wants are, what you love and what you hate, until we have a relationship. And you cannot build that relationship if you're in strictly, your teacher's job is only infor information, grading, did you, you get an A, B, or a C? No, we need to develop this kind of an intimate relationship, you know, a, a friendly relationship, a, a, a balance between friendship and authority between teachers and students. And by the way, the first teachers our children have are our parents, right? And our parents, unfortunately, they're also big on the informative. And our children sp stop talking to us. They don't actually tell us how they feel, and we don't ask them. We don't ask them. This is actually a very Quranic concept. So, I'll, I'll, I, you know, m uh, measuring the targets of success, that's a, that's a second problem. I say we have a much more fundamental problem. We're not communicating with children properly. So I will, I'll leave you with one thing for, to think about from the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us about Yusuf alayhi salam, yes? Now, Yusuf alayhi salam comes to his father. Ya abati inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaban. Wa shams wal qamar ra'aytuhum li sajideen. Okay. So this boy, comes to his father and tells him he saw a dream. That's what the story is? Tell me, which of your children have come to you and told you their dream? And even if they do, if they come to dad or mom? Chances are they go to mom. If they go to dad, they'll say, I'm watching Al Jazeera right now. <laughs> eh, I'm watching the news, which I've been watching for 30 years and have done nothing about. So I need to continue. In other words, the Qur'an is teaching us this phenomenal relationship between father and son where the son is so comfortable with his father that he can go and talk to him even about not something that didn't even happen in reality. It happened where? 
in a dream, and the son knows that my father will not make fun of me. He will not say, what did you eat for, breakfast, for dinner last night? Or, you know, go talk to your mother. He's going to actually listen to me, and he's going to hear what I have to say, and he's going to respond to me. Meaning, we're actually learning in that one ayah how a father is supposed to have a relationship with a child. When we talk about transforming education in the ummah, we have to transform how parents deal with children first. How parents themselves deal with children. And then you're going to see a transformation. Because then you can actually change our, your children's thoughts. Because now you know what they're thinking. Right now, wallahi, most of us, we have no idea what our kids are thinking. We don't know what they're thinking. We just know what, they, well, hopefully we know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, but we don't know what they're thinking. And really, the, the challenge of our time, is we have to get in their heads. We have to get them to communicate with us. If we can accomplish that, Islamic education's got a good future. Inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah, that's um, subhanAllah. The, the lesson that we can take from that comment is that parents are teachers as well. And uh, even if uh, there's a school teacher, they should always sort of communicate with the parents to make sure that they have that influence on their child that's positive as well. Yep. Um, Ustaz, uh, Sister Al Hamadati puts a, f a question forward in regards to Islamic schools in Australia that are required to follow a particular educational curriculum um, and they have to compete with other schools, of course. Um, the question is how these institutions can reconcile discrepancies between producing a high achieving student and also nurturing that um, all-rounded Islamic identity um, you know, of, a, of a Muslim citizen who can engage with the world with that Islamic perspective. Yeah, so I mean it's related to the previous, but I want to share with you that especially when it comes to the high school age, uh, I personally believe Islamic education should minimize its emphasis on the informational. And it should actually emphasize the cognitive. Cognitive means that you're discussing a lot. You're dis you're, 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 through discussion, you're developing thought processes in these kids. In other words, to me, a successful high school graduate is not someone from the Islamic perspective. We talked about Arabic goals before. I'm not talking about Islamic goals. Someone who can think the way Allah wants them to think is far more successful than someone who knows a lot of information about Islam, but their thinking hasn't changed. Okay, to me, that's far more, the thinking process is far more important. In other words, when a child makes it to college, university, and you know, there's a young man, and a, a beautiful girl comes up to him and says, hey, you want to be my lab partner? You know, he's not going to like go in, which IL is it? Oh yeah, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً His knowledge is not, on, not going to benefit him if he didn't develop the right kind of thinking. Like, this is stupid. I, I shouldn't do this, this is beneath me. I'm far more dignified as a Muslim to engage in something like this. I know what this will lead to. They're good enough, they're smart enough to think about that on their own with no parental supervision, with no imam looking over their shoulder, with no lecture in their, in their ear, nothing, on their own. In other words, this, this, co this cognitive process needs to be emphasized. So you can have the standard education and curricular goals that are set by the, you know, the state or whatever in mathematics and science and history and English and all of these things, that's fine. But especially when it comes to high school, we have to, on the Islamic side, there needs to be a discussion-based curriculum. And that's my view. It needs to be a discussion-based curriculum. I'm working towards something like that. The series I've done recently called Quran for Young Adults, the point of it was that students listen to it, like teenagers especially, they listen to it, and they have discussions based on it in Islamic school. Like based on the ideas that were discussed, there's a conversation. I think this and I think that. You know? And I tell you, one of the biggest problems with self-esteem with Muslim youth is that they feel like nobody cares what they think. Nobody cares what they have to say. Like people don't actually listen to them. They always want to be talked to, but not heard from. Right? And we have to give them that sense of worth while they're in our hands. Because once we let them go, it's too late. Once we let them go, it's goodbye. I consider high school the farewell to our children. It's the farewell. Now you're in the world on your own. Now you have to make your own decisions. Now I will not be there to protect you. You know, uh, just in a few years, some of you have 10 year olds, 12 year old kids. By the time they're 16, 17, they are, you can call them your kids. You will call them your kids when they're 75, that's fine. But they're not kids anymore. Now they're adults and they're gonna have to make their own choices. We have to prepare them to make those choices. That is the goal of Islamic education. And that, if you can do that, that's not a lot of information. That's not an overemphasis on you have to memorize 15 juz and you have to get in the jaza in this and you have to do this. no 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 you can do a lot of that mechanical stuff earlier on kids can memorize very quickly in the earlier stage they can learn a lot of arabic too they can learn a lot of that stuff 
but in, especially in the teenage years, and by the way, uh, the, many of you are in education, I was told, you know, the hardest group to teach is who? Teenagers, they're disinterested. They're not interested. You can sit and talk to them and they're like, <sighs> can I go now? You know, they're so hard to entertain. And if we don't interest them, then we have failed. My issue is if we have not piqued their interest, then we have failed. So we have to ask that question when it comes to, you know, how do we create the right kind of personality? You, we have to, un honestly, we have to study marketing and advertising and branding. And we have to understand how do you pitch, how do you sell something to teenagers? You know, how do you understand the teenage market? And how do you brand something to them? Because we have to reach them on their terms. They will not come to our terms. You, sta you, alhamdulillah, when you were being raised, you went to the masjid, the shaykh sat in front of you, you sat respectfully, and when you said, min qablu, he said, min qablu, and you're like, oh, okay, min qablu, you know, that's not going to be your kid. Those days are gone. They're, they're in Sydney. There are lots of, they, they don't have to do that anymore. They're, they're in a free society, you know. So we're going to have to respect that they're in a free society and not expect from them what was expected from us. Because it's a different world. It's a different world for them. You cannot have realistically the same expectations. I hope that Allah Azza gives us the, the wisdom to raise our children with that kind of strength. I mean, Mr. Though we've spoken about children, we've spoken about teenagers. There's also a question about adults, grown up adults who have yes. careers and um, they, they leave a senior position, for example, for a simpler job to allow them to spend more time worshipping Allah, learning Arabic, memorizing the Quran. What is the Quranic, um, uh, sort of, how does the Quran address this and what is your advice? So, uh, the Quran actually has a lot to say about this. And if I start on that, then we're going to be here for a long time. But I, I will tell you some things. Um, you know, s mashallah, some people are high achievers. So they, when they graduate out of school and graduate out of college and university, they get a good job. And they get promoted rather quickly. And they get into management and executive management positions. They even start their own company, you know, and they become millionaires or whatever it is. But, you know, the problem with these jobs is the more successful you get, the more time-consuming they become. Right, for instance, if you're in the technology industry, then you have to keep up with changing emerging technologies. And if you don't, for six months, if you don't keep up with the new trends, you're a dinosaur, you're irrelevant, your career is done. So in other words, you're at your job while at your job, also at your job when you're at home keeping up with the new language that just came out, or the new update that just came out, right? So you're, you're consumed by your career. I know this because I used to be in that industry. And I, I was consumed by my career. Now the thing is, uh, on the one hand, the Qur'an's you know, uh, perspective on excelling in the world, like excelling in your career, excelling in your business, literally the advice given to Qarun, wa ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk. Excel the way Allah excelled to you, towards you. In other words, excelling in every field in life is an Islamic perspective. Excelling in your career, excelling in your education, excelling in your business is an Islamic perspective. But ihsan, true ihsan, is not that you excel in one thing, and at the, at the expense of other things. True ihsan, true excellence, is that you're awesome at taking care of your health. You're also excellent in your career. You're also excellent in your marriage. You're also excellent in your parenting. You're also excellent in your t giving time to your parents. You're also excellent with your friends. You're also excellent at taking a, taking a break and relaxing and chilling. When you chill, you really know how to chill. Now, in other words, there are different aspects of your life. You're, you're awesome in your worship. You're excellent in your worship. You're excellent in your learning of deen. There are, you have to make a list of things that you have to do in life that are obligated, that are, that are religious obligations. And you have to learn to balance them and do right by all of them. The problem is, there are some things I like doing. Please listen to this carefully. There are some things I like doing and some things I don't like doing. Like I like studying Arabic. Honestly, personally, I like studying Arabic. Right? But I don't like cleaning up the house. Sounds like me. You know? Not you, right? You love cleaning the house. Oh. I can, I can tell. Okay, so, but anyway, I don't like it. But you know what? Are both of those important? So I need to take time to study, and I need to take time to clean up. Especially a lot of you that are volunteers, you love volunteering. You love teaching. And you love it so much that you don't spend any time at home, you're always teaching. You're always volunteering. You're the guy at the masjid two days before the program setting the chairs. And your wife is texting, you're like, I'm doing this fi sabilillah, innama azwajukum amwalakum. Your wives, your children are, you know, 
You text them the ayah and you keep fixing the chairs. No, no, no. Go home, dude. Just go home. Don't overdo it. Like we have to... Ihsan is really about balance. And if you study the ayah of Qarun, Qarun made a lot of money, right? And what, did, what, what was the advice given to them? That advice was so valuable that it became advice to the day of judgment for all of us. For someone who's achieving high things. وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ also, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Don't forget your portion from the dunya. You have to do stuff for deen, but you have obligations in dunya too. You have to spend time with your wife. You have to take her out to dinner. You have to watch the kids a couple of days a week so she can hang out with her friends. You have to do that too. That's also part of your balance. Because if you start compromising one side, then everything will start falling apart. There are people, you know there are people that are so obsessed with learning Islam that their families are suffering. That's not a good, that's not something Islam asks for. This is not what our deen teaches. There are people that are doing so well in their business, but they don't know their children. They don't even know their kids. Their dad's always at the job, always at the restaurant, always at the hospital, always somewhere, working, 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 and they don't even know him. They have no idea who he is. The only time they go to their dad is when they need some money. You know? So we, we, we get into one thing, we really get into it. The, the whole idea of obsessive compulsive disorder. The Muslim Ummah unfortunately suffers with a lot of OCD. We get into one thing and we forget everything else. You know, we cannot do this. So even if someone has a great career, and if their career was overwhelming their life, I'm happy for them that they took a less serious job. So they have time for other things. But what are those other things? Yes, part of that is learning Islam. Part of that is memorizing the Quran. Part of that is spending time with your parents. Part of that is spending time with your family. Part of that is doing some exercise. Part of that is fixing your diet. Part of that is taking a break. Go take a break. Go travel a little bit. You know, take time for yourself. It's fine. Play some sports. Do something. But we, if we can, you know, preach this balance, if we can preach this balance, then we're, we're doing something in line with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Last comment about this. You guys are familiar with Surah Al-Hujurat. Surah Al-Hujurat is I, one, of the, to, one of the most fascinating places in the Quran to me because these Bedouins came to the Prophet's apartment ﷺ, and they said, Ya Muhammad, ukhruj alayna. Muhammad, come out, we have a question for you. These guys were uncultured, you know, and they were like, you know, maybe they were like Texan or something. So they, they just came and they said, we, we want to talk to you. And the ayat came down. That they need to show proper respect. But what's really un, unthought of, like we don't really give enough attention to, is the fact that Rasulullah has 23 years. Really, I mean, in hindsight, it's 2020. We know now he has only 23 years to deliver the, the heaviest message and the biggest responsibility ever given to a human being. He has only 23 years. Inna sanulki alayka qawlan thaqila, right? And still he has time to be home with the wife. So when they have a question, where do they go? To the house. Because he's not sitting in Masjid Nabi for an open QA session. He's with the wife. And they have to go there and knock and find time for him, from him. The Sahaba stay late at night at the Prophet's house. The ayah comes down, go home, let him sleep. You need to leave. Because some people don't know if they've overstayed their welcome. Why? Because we're being taught that Rasul has obligations also towards his own family. That's within these 23 years, the entire Quran will be given. If you were given anything close to that responsibility, you would forget every other responsibility. But the Rasul is being given constant balance. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now how can we claim to be part of that legacy and forget balance? You know? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the balance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, Ustav, there's a couple of questions from uh, students from the MSAs. Uh, sure. Sister Tasmiya Islam would like to know if there are other da'wah initiatives other than lectures and stools that they can do um, at university and some of your experiences with giving da'wah to university academics and students. I think it's really important to understand that university is a time of exploration. Um, a lot of people are, a lot of youth feel like, well, we're among the kuffar and we have to give them da'wah to Islam and all of that, which I, I'm happy for you. But the problem is you have to be ready for it. If you're not ready for it, you're going to land yourself in a lot of trouble. And what activities can you do? First of all, I think it's really important that Muslim youth are in touch with Muslim academics. Not just Muslim traditional scholars, Muslim academics that have gone through the university, Western university settings, and have held on to their faith even though they've gone through the university settings. Why? Because those people can help you hold on to your faith even though it's being intellectually challenged all the time. So people like Yasser Qadi are really important. 
People like Professor Omar Muzaffar, I mean, I, I know the people in the, in, in the United States, or a few people in the United Kingdom, like, you know, Professor Abdul Halim, or Professor, or Sheikh Akram Nadwi, for example. And I'm sure there are people like that here. Intellectuals, Muslim intellectuals, that have faced Western criticism directly at the university setting, and have held on to their faith nonetheless. These are the people you have to hold on, you have to have a connection with in your university years. Because they will, on the one hand we have a spiritual challenge, and on the other hand we have an intellectual challenge. And these people help us hold on and not lose the intellectual battle. That's one. The second thing is the university is an opportunity where your first priority, my opinion, my humble opinion, uh, uh, your first priority is not towards non-Muslims, but it's actually towards the Muslims. A lot of Muslim youth are going to university and they lose their religion in the university. Here we are worried about giving da'wah to non-Muslims while we're losing our own children that were raised with la ilaha illallah. And they no longer have it, they've become skeptical or agnostic or whatever else. So what is the MSA's role? I think one of its fundamental roles is to provide a safe social environment where people feel comfortable coming. If a girl, a Muslim girl doesn't wear hijab or a guy that does drugs and he goes to school, he even can come into the MSA room and pray once in a while and nobody's going to yell at him. That might be the only connection to Islam they ever get because these are the kinds of people who will never come to a masjid. So the closest thing to a masjid for them is an MSA room. That's the closest thing to that. So we have to be cognizant of that and befriend those kinds of people and take them in our wing and not necessarily give them da'wah, just take them out for some pizza. Just give them some time. You know, befriend them. And when they see the, the ukhuwa, the sincerity, the love, the concern you have for them, then you don't have to give them a speech. They'll come to Islam on their own. I tell you this because I'm a product of that process. I myself am a product of that. I was not interested in Islam in college at all. And it is because of a friend who used to hang out with me and we used to go for pizza. That's why I mentioned pizza. That, and he never, he never preached to me, never. And he knew if I, if I can tell you now, if he tried to preach to me, I would have never, never hung out with him again. I would have never done it. I said, no way, dude. But he had a nice car. And I used to take the train home, and this way I could get a ride with him too. So he's cool, man. He gives me a ride home. And we go for pizza sometimes. And after like three months of this, one time we were stuck in traffic from Maghrib, and he pulled over and said, can I pray? If you, if you don't mind, can I pray? And that's the one time after four years, I hadn't made a single salah in four years, that's the one time I went and I made salah. Mm -hmm. Not because he told me to pray. Because he said, do you mind? if you don't mind, I'm just going to go pray, bro. It's just going to take five minutes. I was like, oh, I'll come with you. <laughs> and I, I went and prayed with him. They, they need, these people need company. They don't need our judgment. Allah is enough for that. They don't need our judgment. They don't need our anger. They need our patience, they need our love, and they need our company. And the university is a great setting to do that. You're going to meet the kinds of Muslims that you will not meet in any other Islamic setting. They're not going to be at the lecture. They're not going to be at the Jumu'ah prayer. They're, you're lucky if they're at the Eid prayer. You're lucky if they're there. But they are at the university. Right? So that needs to be our, our goal. And as a matter of fact, I even know of brothers and sisters who became Muslim in university because of just hanging out with the Muslims. Because the Muslims were the friendliest, nicest, kindest, most courteous people. Real da'wah is when you guys carry yourselves as concerned human beings in a time where everyone is selfish. Everybody only cares about themselves. But you guys carry yourselves differently. You will attract, you know, a gr girls group, there's going to be a bunch of Christian girls that just want to hang out with you guys. Because you're not judging. Right now the problem is we're so judgmental even of our own selves, forget everybody else. We're even so harsh on, on each other that we've created a hostile environment in masajid. We've created a hostile environment in MSAs. That needs to be undone. And that's a real priority and hopefully a legacy you can leave behind for future generations to come at your school, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Ustav, uh, another question for, from the MSA in regards to showing the beauty of the Qur'an to a non-Muslim. I mean, we mentioned before that the Qur'an has repetition of stories over and over again. How can you show and tell someone about the beauty of the Qur'an, this miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who does not understand the Arabic, can't read the language? Sure. Uh, I have a lot to say about that, but I'll, I'll start with the most important principle. There's like an usul in my head, an asal in my head of how you have to go about this. If your conversation with someone about the Qur'an or about Islam is turning into a debate, then you need to stop. Then you need to stop. The psychology of a debate is very dangerous. In the psychology of a debate, I am trying to win against you, and you are trying to win against me. So it's actually a match, like a sports game. Okay? And in a sports game, even if I scored a really good goal, you're not going to be like, ah, thanks a lot for that goal. I really appreciated that point. No, because me making a point that you couldn't answer is a kind of defeat for you, isn't it? 
Does anybody enjoy being defeated? No. And if you do get defeated, then what's the only thing on your mind? Revenge. You got me with this point. I will study and study and study until I find a way to refute your point. The d debates are not about finding the truth. Debates are about one defeating the other. It's a competition. Now the deen of Allah is an invitation. Yes? It's that we call it da'wah, which is what? An invitation. Is a debate an invitation? No. An invitation is an act of friendship, is an act of courtesy, is an act of you know, love even. But a debate may be an act of animosity, an act of aggression, right? So we, we call it da'wah and we end up doing mujadala. <laughs> da'wah is something else. Da'wah is a non-confrontational setting. Now let's talk about the Qur'an with this, with this principle. Our job is to actually not convince someone that the Qur'an is the word of Allah. Our job is to say, hey, you know what? I was reading the Qur'an the other day. I found this thing that was so beautiful. I don't even, I'm not even going to say, hey, 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 by the way, this one miracle, once I explain it to you, it will be clear to you that this is the word of Allah. And if you don't accept that, you are a kafir. <laughs> you know, and if you, and if you still reject it, why don't you bring a surah like it? Bring a surah. I was like, what's a surah? I just came here for pizza. Like, what's a surah? <laughs> Stop it, kafir. Don't eat the pizza. Go bring a surah like it. Like, I was like, here. <laughs> Hold on, homie. Just take it easy. Take it easy. You want to share the beauty of the Qur'an, not convince someone of the beauty of it, share. You know how you share something you enjoy on Facebook? You're not, you don't call someone and say, hey, did you watch that video? Did you like it? I mean, at second 33, it was really amazing, wasn't it? I could prove it to you. That was the best scene. Like, you don't do that. It's something so obviously beautiful that everybody else just enjoys it. And some people will like it and some people will. Not like it, but you know what? That doesn't take away from the value of the Qur'an. Like my teacher, Dr. Uh, Samir Rai, in one of his books explained, somebody dove into the ocean and pulled out a pearl. And said, whoa, look at this pearl, isn't it beautiful? And somebody else dove in and pulled out another pearl. And they said, no, your pearl, huh? This one, this is beautiful. And some other guy comes, I don't like pearls. Now the thing is, when we reflect on the Qur'an, and we share something beautiful about the Qur'an, that is just one pearl, isn't it? That is just one pearl. Are there more pearls down there? And it's not just pearls, there are other kinds of treasures down there too. And they're endless. Now if somebody doesn't like your pearl, that's not kufr. That's just your pearl, dude. That's just what you like. And you're not there to convince them, you better love this pearl. Otherwise, you kafir. No, 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 no. You say, hey, look, this is why I really love this beautiful gem. This is what I, re I found really fascinating. This is what I found really beautiful. This is what I found really thought-provoking. In other words, it's not in the context of a debate that you're proving the word of Allah is the word of Allah, but in the context of just a conversation. Man, I read something so beautiful the other day. And at one time, you don't even mention it's from the Qur'an. You don't even mention it's from the Qur'an. You say like, you know, I was reading the other day that God, He brought us out of our mothers. And instead of saying He brought us out of our mothers and we didn't know anything, he said, he brought, a, brought, brought us out of our mothers, and we still don't know anything. You know, هُوَ الَّذِي أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُولِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا Not, لَمْ تَعْلَمُوا شَيْئًا أَوْ مَا عَلِمْتُمْ شَيْئًا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا He brought you out of your mothers, and you still don't know anything. Man, that's so humbling. Like, we, th we, we think we didn't know anything when we were babies, and now we're being told what? We still don't know anything. We still don't know anything. Compared to the knowledge of Allah, what do we have? You know? They're like, oh, that's deep, man. Where is that? Is that the Bible? I never read that in the Bible. No, no, that's actually the Quran. Really? The Quran? Yeah, yeah, it's the Quran. You know, you can bring it up in a very casual setting. You avoid confrontation at all costs. Especially in college youth, they love confrontation. They love it. Like they set up the, the, the stall, discover Islam, or why I become Muslim, and you know, come, come over Kufar and ask me any question you want. The big poster that says, produce a surah like it. Like, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. You know? So you can have, and it's okay to have booths and stalls and da'wah pamphlets and all these other things, but you have to, be, you have to know your stuff when you do those kinds of things.
don't, don't put yourself in difficult situations. You don't know how to handle them, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah, we've had uh, quite a lot of questions in regards to um, you know, the Australian Muslim community. It's a diverse community. It's young. It's developing. Um, so it's much younger than, for example, America and the UK. Many questions have come in regards to dealing with differences of opinion within the community. Uh, for example, Brother Azadul Alam gives an example of moon sighting calculation. Um, some others have asked if there are any conciliatory elements that you can suggest. Some questions have come in whether there needs to be a united voice or whether this is an unrealistic expectation that we should just abandon. Is there anything that you have experienced from America that you can sure. share with us, inshallah? Oh, yeah, I can share a lot with you on that one. Um, what does it mean to be a united ummah is the real question. And we have the answer to that question for us has become some very superficial, artificial things. If you're not praying Eid on the same day, that does not mean you're not a united ummah. It has, no, it has no, no connection to being a united ummah. Are there legitimate differences among the ulama on these issues? Legitimate differences, yes? Which means the one who's praying Eid the day before you and you are both Muslims and both still love each other. You're both, you both still love each other. There were sahaba that traveled from one village to another finding they're still fasting. And they've already prayed Eid. That happened back e even back then. You understand? And they, they didn't travel to different time zones. That's just the next village over. It's just the next town over. You know? It's not even a different time zone. It's just the next zip code. And they, they, they were praying on different days. It's okay. Some differences are not the end of the world. It's okay. You know, you don't have to turn them into a big deal. Now, what are the things that we have to emphasize? See, the thing is, when we emphasize the small things, then there will be disagreements. And when we emphasize the big things, there will be unity. What have I talked to you about today? I've talked to you about the importance of raising our children correctly, yes? Is that something all of us share? Is that a unifier? Yeah. But if I talk to you about, you know, Zabiha versus Ahlul Kitab meat, would that be something that unifies all of us? Practically never, never. If you want unity in the ummah, you make the issues that are a concern to all of us the most important issues. And the issues that are personal fiqh matters. You leave them in your personal life and you don't make them a part of a debate. You leave them in your personal life. You learn from the fuqaha that you're convinced of. Your imam has an opinion, you find that opinion convincing, you stick with it. That's up to you, that's fine. But you don't bring that into the debate. What should be brought in public discourse is what do we do with our teenagers that are ending up in drugs. That's a concern all of us have. What do we do with the marriages that have abuse in them? What do we do with these children you know, that, are, that, are, that are leaving Islam? These young kids that are leaving Islam, what do we do with them? How do we solve this problem? How do we solve the problem of our young girls and we can't find suitable boys for them to get married to? That's a problem every family has. We have to emphasize these problems. And then what happens is, then you will find a common platform where everybody can share this concern and we're all making the community a better place because the community is helping our families just like our families are helping the community. Right? This is the, this is the thing. The disagreements will always be there. Wallahi, ikhtilaf will always be there. It will always, always it will never go away. But that does not mean we're not, a one, we're not one ummah. You know? That's, a, that's an artificial d measure of unity. I tell you, let me, I mean my own thoughts on this. We are on the day of Jumu'ah, we are all in rows together, but one guy is praying next to the other guy and he looks at him and he looks at the color of his skin or he looks at the country he's from and he's like disturbed by this guy praying next to him. Our hearts are not together. Our physical forms are together, but our hearts are not together. That's a bigger problem for unity. I mean, the, us gathered together in a masjid is the appearance of unity. You know, تَحْسَبُهُمْ جَمِيعًا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ شَتَّى is a description of munafiqoon. You know, description of disbelievers even. Not us. But unfortunately, it's become a reality. So we have to break, you know, barriers. Things like racism is a big concern. Classism is a big concern. Tribalism is a big concern. These are things that concern all of us. And we have to attack them. Inshallah ta'ala. And then you will see natural unity. You won't have to give khutbahs about unity. You're just talking about something that unifies people anyway. You know? And just... just one platform. Okay, one crazy example and I'm done. I gave a lecture in, in Birmingham in England and it's not a fun place to go. Uh, so in Birmingham has a very fragmented Muslim community. Some people believe in one school of thought, they have their own masjid. Another people believe in another school of thought, they have their own masjid across the street. These ones call themselves Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They call themselves Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, but there's Jama'atain, you know. So 
uh, but anyway, so they have that, and, and, and it's very, very harsh. It's very harsh, very intensely fragmented community, right? They, they can't stand each other. They can't stand each other. The only thing that unites them is probably the halal restaurant, the burger they all unite on. But anyway, so I give this lecture, I give this talk there, and there's about a thousand people in the audience. And in the middle of a break, a young man and a woman come up to me, and they come up to me and they say, um, brother, thank you for doing this. Please don't tell anyone. I'm actually a Shi'i, and this is my wife, and we brought 50 of our friends because we love listening to your explanation of the Quran. But if the people here found out, they would go crazy. Please don't tell them, but just you, you should know that we appreciate what you're doing even in the Shia community. And we're learning a lot from you. Then a Baha'i came to me. The Baha'is make the Shias look normal. As far as like they're, the, 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 like for us, what, what the Shia is like, you know, an extreme. For us, it's an extreme. For the Sunnis, some of their beliefs are extreme. For the, the Baha'is are way extreme. They came up to me, we've been listening to your lectures. Now I'm th sitting there going, I talk about the Sahaba. I talk about Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala who every chance I get, if the ayat come up, you know. You know, إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا You know, ثاني اثنين When the ayat come up, who do I talk about? I talk about Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. When I'm discussing Surah uh, Muhammad, who am I talking about? I'm talking about the, the Basira of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I talk about these people all the time. How is a Shi'i coming and listening to me? How, how so? You know why? Because what am I emphasizing in the Quran? Actually, I'm emphasizing the Quran itself, which is supposed to be a unifier. Ustad, we are um, running out of time, and uh, we want to try and ask you as many questions as we okay, can, okay. Uh, as that we have uh, left, inshallah. So we're going to put you in the hot seat. Oh, hot Ask seat. you some quick questions, inshallah. Um, are you ready? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Are we ready? Okay. Um, if there was one person that could become a Muslim, who would you like it to be? God. Quick, quick, quick. Is this hard? <laughs> one person? Why one would person. I want one person to become Muslim? Good answer. Summer or winter? Winter. Sure. If you were stuck in the ocean, which app would you like to have on your phone? Wait, what did you just say? Was that English? <laughs> if you were stuck on the ocean, which app would you like to have on your phone? It's Australian English. Street Fighter. S <laughs> How do you like your steak, medium or rare? Steak? Yes. I don't like steak. What do you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> My dad asks me that all the time. <laughs> I still haven't come up with an answer. <laughs> Who is your favorite Quran reciter? Uh, Muhammad Sadiq al Minshawi. Houseboat or speedboat? Who? Houseboat or speedboat? What's your preference? S I don't even know the difference, dude. But speedboat. <laughs> I'll go with speedboat. Okay. Your favorite present-day tafsir scholar? Present day. Uh, alive, you mean still? Yeah. Oh, I love Sheikh Muhammad Ratib al Nabulsi. Allahu Akbar. And uh, your favorite verse in the Quran? I don't have one. Social media, love it or I, hate I, it? That changes every week. That changes every Subhanallah. week. Subhanallah. Huh? Social media, love it or hate it? Um, I use it. Just your living role model. Huh? Your living role model. My living role model? Yes. Um, there's a few of those. Uh, I don't want to say they're in the audience. No worries. Um, your favorite PlayStation game? Street Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we'll be back in Sydney, inshallah. Uh, well, you've got to answer all the rest of the questions that have come in, so we're hoping Next that it will be... Next time I'm back in Sydney? Are you serious? Uh, I don't know. If w I have to ask the Department of Domestic Affairs. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we really hope that... I get uh, approval. <laughs> We uh, really hope that uh, that time will come very, very soon, inshallah. Ustad Nu'man uh, Ali Khan, Jazakallah khair for being with us today um, and sharing with this, uh, this amazing inspiration and thoughts, inshallah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you to carry your work on and allow the, the ummah to benefit from it. And the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gathered us here, Allah, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us in a better place with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dear viewers, brothers and sisters, thank you for tuning in um, and watching this One Path Network special. Until next time, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.